So again, uh, welcome Rosemary Lee on Hybrid Lab. And uh, you know, we are uh, all happy that uh, we could listen to your lecture on machine learning and not notions of the image imager. Uh, we had in the previous lectures, we had heard uh, David who was talking about sound and music and environment. And this time we are moving to the images and Rosemary Lee is again coming from the University of Copenhagen. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Matei. Um, OK, so sorry, I'm going to try to share my slides with you. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this talk summarizes some of the main points from my PhD project, Machine Learning and Notions of the Image, um, where I examine how current artistic practices employing machine learning connect to discourse surrounding image production. So machine learning has come to have a significant influence on the creation, analysis, and circulation of images. And in so doing, it contributes to the vast scale of information processing, which is now commonplace. Following Melanie Mitchell's definition, machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence in which machines learn from data or their own experiences. Machines are thereby made to simulate the process of learning, improving their performance of a given task over time. And when applied to image making, machine learning enables images to be generated as the result of analysis of data. For instance, creating new images fitting a particular class of image from analyzing examples. Generative adversarial networks, or GANs, for example, have proven highly successful at producing photorealistic images um, in the, the manner shown here. Um, beyond the direct generation of images, machine learning also is also applies to uh, discriminative tasks such as image classification or identifying objects and images. It's therefore found its way beyond research context into a wide range of everyday applications, such as facial recognition or other tasks in which it performs more of an analytical role than generative approaches. Machine learning has a capacity to facilitate new modalities and aesthetics in visual media, such as enabling new levels of interactivity or allowing digital graphics to be overlaid on top of more straightforward video, such as in augmented or mixed reality settings. It also plays an important, though often less easily discernible role in shaping the display of visual media through algorithmic personalization, tailoring what content appears for a given user based on collected data. The growing presence, technical possibilities, and cultural significance of machine learning and artificial intelligence has led to a surge of interest in these topics among artists. In my research draws together examples from a wide variety of different contexts, but it primarily focuses on artistic practice. This responds to the fact that while machine learning is a relatively new paradigm of image production, it touches on a number of issues that have been explored at length in the history of art and in theories of the image. Some of the central issues which arise in this regard concern the defining qualities of the image, often differentiating between visual and non-visual, the author of authorship of images, whether by human or machine, and the participation of visual technologies in the mediation of perception and the representational capacity of images. So in contrast to purely technical examples, artists' explorations with machine learning also provide unique insight into the zeitgeist of visual culture, addressing factors surrounding the production, reception, and significance of images. 
And by adding to the range of attributes and modalities images may take on, machine learning adds to the existing complexity of discourse surrounding image production. It's for this reason that I argue that recent notions of the image have compounded and expanded upon rather than distinctly breaking from earlier notions of the image. There's a reciprocal relationship between how we see the effects of visual technologies and the images we in turn produce. The increasing use of algorithms to create and to interpret images makes it necessary to consider what precisely we mean when we refer, refer to visual media as algorithmic. An algorithm itself is not computational. It's a set of modular or autonomous instructions in execution for the doing or making of something, which includes necessary elements, constraints, and procedure taken together dynamically. This definition from Jamie Bianco enables us to understand algorithmic processes not as confined to the specificity of any one particular medium or technology, such as the digital computer. Rather, they're defined by their processual nature. In the finiteness of algorithms, Friedrich Kittler describes technical apparatuses and the tools of art as things within which knowledge, often thousands of years of knowledge, have accumulated. He traces the term algorithm back to lesser known instantiations than its current usage. From the ninth century in what is now Uzbekistan through a myriad of different examples which have shaped our understanding of algorithms today. This grounding connecting to much earlier in instances in order to understand historical tendencies in algorithmic media is central to my research. So rather than strictly adhering to media archeology span as a particular methodological approach, I understand it as an influence which colors my perspective as a researcher. Um, and the algorithmic qualities um, of images are recognizable in much older methods of image making than those employed currently. This can be seen as in such instances as the use of geometric canons of representation, which are governed by proportional relations between um, the internal components of images. In these examples, the mathematical system acts as a guide for the execution of the image. Another compelling example of the analog use of algorithmic processes comes from the history of cartography. Ptolemy's Geographia involved the transcription of maps as sets of coordinates, which act as latent images able to be interpreted into visual representations from an index. What I find most significant about this instance is the notion of the image, not as a representation in pictures, but as a data set. As Alexander Galloway points out, a single networked, or as he called it, data image may be produced by thousands and thousands of end users on their laptops. This gives the image the seemingly paradoxical capacity to be visualized by innumerable users dispersed in time and space. And in digital media, we can think of this in terms of the relation between the digital image and the code for its execution. A JPEG or PDF file, for example, is an image, whether or not it's visualized through its display on a screen or in another form. This object by Art Node, for example, offers an interesting instance of how an image may or may not be um, translated between various file formats, even taking the form of three dimensions and being printed as an object. Conceptual artists have explored the potential for images and artworks in general to be executed according to rigorous sets of instructions. There may be some room for variation within the constraints so that each time the work is created, it may be slightly different, like in these works by Solowit. Um, surrealist automatism has been influential for the development of approaches to art making, which explore the potential for the artists to at least partially give up conscious control of the artistic process using techniques such as automatic writing or automatic drawing. 
The work of Vera Molnar has employed related approaches in which she created artworks based on what she called an imaginary machine. In this case, she took on the role of a computer, one that or whom computes, executing images according to a predefined program. So this touches on generative strategies in art in which an autonomous system guides or controls the development of an artwork. One strategy which is often used in generative image making processes is the use of recombination, engaging aspects of randomness within a set of carefully defined constraints. A good example of this is the cut up method, many variations of which can be found in art in the 20th century. And I've adopted similar strategies in my own work using simple processes such as the flip of a coin or the roll of a die to generate instructions for images. The image as such exists as a textual artifact, which may be translated into pixel values and articulated as a digital image. And in the series, I employed various kinds of algorithmic approaches, which involved increasing levels of automation, leading to more complex outcomes in the, the images that are then generated. In addition to the simple algorithmic qualities described thus far, the incorporation of linear perspective into the image plane restructured pictorial representation in accordance with the principles of optics. Bruno Lesci, who was credited as the first to create a developed system of linear perspective, also invented the apparatus shown here. It, the device demonstrates a very particular relationship between visual technologies, human vision and image making. And it enables a viewer to compare an image employing linear perspective with the real world view it's intended to represent. The technical apparatus is thereby placed in the position of mediating between how the world is perceived and how it's represented in images. The rigorous implementation of optical techniques and apparatus gave images greater compatibility with human vision than pre-perspectival images, which were less concerned with verisimilitude. That is the appearance of being true or real and instead pre-perspectival images were more symbolic in nature, like the image shown here. Um, the algorithmic processes covered thus far have mainly been executed manually in analog forms, but an important aspect of algorithmic media is, is its potential for automation using machines. The automation of many pro production processes during the Industrial Revolution posed a challenge to establish norms and to the artists and artisans who viewed their craftsmanship as threatened by the products of mechanized processes. But rather than genuinely removing the human from the process, the idea of mechanical automation merely obscures the human labor behind it. The theme of automation and the assumption of the autonomy of machine image production from the human is deeply rooted in the history of photography. In, in its early days, photography was seen as being inferior to painting because of its reliance on automation. This lent itself to the idea that it was the machine and not the photographer who was responsible for any artistic merit a photographic image may have. Andreas Brockman calls this the myth of the machine as artist a theme which continues to arise in relation to technically produced images even today. In addition to this, because the camera was seen as distancing the photographic process from the subjectivity of the photographer, it also contributed to a view of technically produced images as innately objective or truthful. This is contradicted somewhat by the optical illusions found in pre-cinematic devices for example, because although they employ um, technical apparatus and the principles of optics, they don't dare guarantee any accuracy or truth in visual media. And devices such as the praxinoscope, the magic lantern, or the stereoscope that are shown here um, 
Optics is used explicitly to trick the eye into seeing something that isn't real. Um, but in many other situations, other than um, pre-cinema, like the examples that I just covered, it's more difficult to discern truth from fiction. Um, and this I kind of relate to the history of forensic photography um, and the work of Alphonse Bertillon, who was a pioneer in, uh, in the techniques of forensic photography. He notably invented a technique which is known now as a mugshot, like the picture on the left. And he also created some of the earliest crime scene photographs, like the one on the right in that slide. Um, oh, yeah. Um, but while Bertillon's mugshot became a reliable technique for identifying crime suspects, similar approaches have also been adopted and um, manipulated in dubious practices, such as the work of criminologist Cesar Lombroso, who attempted to so associate particular physical attributes in people um, to an inherent demeanor of supposed crimin criminality. Um, and this idea that he used was that certain people must be criminals because they look like criminals in his, his view. And um, similar approaches have been used in numerous um, very problematic attempts to visually di differentiate bodies with various discriminatory intentions. Similarly, many applications of machine learning lean heavily on the idea of, of uh, machine learning as an objective approach and inherently um, connected to science and technology and, and this uh, production of truth. Um, but there have been many instances in which machine learning systems have proven to entail built-in bias, reiterating or even amplifying cultural stereotypes or prejudices. As Don Eide has pointed out, techno-scientific instruments may expand or enhance human perception and ability at the same time as imposing their own interpretive processes upon that mediation. So a great deal of attention has, has been paid to parallels between our ways of seeing following John Berger and ways of machine seeing, to use Jeff Cox's turn of phrase. But the apparatus or process involved are not merely extensions of perception and ability but actually exert their own influence on visual media. So approaching the technological mediation um, of, of perception as non-neutral is therefore important to grasping the feedback loop which occurs between the technical conditions of image making and how they are in turn understood. So although we primarily think of images in visual terms, many theorists have also sought to understand the non-visual aspects of images. Joanna Zielinska has recently argued that even visual, um, even vision itself is not visual in the sense that it's ultimately translated into biological signals that are interpreted by the brain. In this sense, the highly automated performance of visual processing tasks by machines could be understood as a kind of sightless vision, to use the words of Paul Virilio, in which machine vision may perform complex visual tasks, albeit through vastly different means than those involved in human biological vision. As we can see in these examples, um, the difference between images generated using machine learning and those produced using more traditional media, such as photography or painting, it's not always strictly or um, tangibly visual in nature. Digital media may easily simulate the visual effects of other media and the technical processes behind an image are not always visually accessible. Additionally, images may, not, may be heterogeneous, having attributes of various different image paradigms at once. Friedrich Nacke describes 
visual media as interfacing between the visual surface of the image and what he calls the subface or the non-visualized processes which occur below or behind the surface of an image. Harun Faroqi's operative or operational image reimagines the image in terms of the performance of spatial procedures, which are not necessarily to be understood as primarily visual. These are images, he says, that do not represent an object, but are rather part of an operation. The examples he gives to illustrate what an op operational image is include the processing of visual information performed by robots programmed to navigate semi-autonomously. And he pays particular attention to drones um, in, in, uh, used in war. In such cases, cameras and other visual technologies act as stand-ins for the eye, while also demonstrating a gap that exists between the processes involved in machine vision and those of human vision. In a similar gesture towards the non-visual qualities of images, according to Hito style, a poor image is a copy in motion. Its quality is bad, its resolution substandard. As it accelerates, it deteriorates. In this sense, Styro argues for the performance of images to be prioritized over their resolution, which has traditionally been a marker of aesthetic quality and value. Adversarial approaches in which inputs may be designed to effectively attack a machine learning system have been of particular interest to artists for the potential to reveal discrepancies that arise between human and machine vision. Adversarial approaches often aim to deceive computers while remaining intelligible to humans, such as in this example where adversarial noise is added to an image to make it more difficult to classify. The genre of fooling images, such as the one pixel attack shown here, demonstrate how there may be a remarkable difference between human visual surface of an image and the computational processes behind it. By modifying only one pixel in, the, in, in an image in this case, it's possible to trigger a misclassification by the machine learning system. Similarly, this work by Adam Harvey called CV Dazzle is an interesting case because it addresses aspects of invisibility which arise between human vision and uh, machine vision. In this case, by disrupting the combination of features which a facial recognition system um, understands as a face, renders the face illegible, and that illegibility causes the face to be imperceptible. This is related to the concept of Umwelt, which describes the relation between an organism's perceptual ability and its related capacity to react to its environment. In this sense, the limits of an organism's capacity to perceive the world around it directly colors and influences its ability to act on and to react to that environment. We can find parallels between how this works in various kinds of perceptual systems, whether biological, technical, or a hybrid of both. And a given agent's technical um, capacity a given agent's uh, capacity to take in information about the world around it in turn affects its ability to react to that world. So Pierre Uc uh, invokes the concept of Umwelt directly in the title of this work, where he uses it to describe a com complex process of mediation between various kinds of images involving biological and technical systems. Using an experimental technique called deep image reconstruction, the artist translated the neural activity of individuals thinking about a particular object into images which are shown in the exhibition. And this involves a combination of fMRI scans and, and a GAN to translate brain activity into a visualization. The work also appears to reference a series of images by Peter Blythewell um, depicting variations of a grasshopper 
as it is imagined, as it is observed, and as it is remembered. In this way, the work Umwelt demonstrates how technology intercedes in the mediation of perception, but also how we think about what we perceive. But interestingly, the artist asserts that the work does not need the public. It's not made for us or addressed to us. It doesn't need the gaze to exist. This sentiment is echoed in the work of Joanna Zelinska, who uh, um, has created a concept of non-human photography, which she says, images are not primarily by, of, or for humans. That what she means, for example, is highly autonomous imaging systems in which humans play little more than a supporting role in the process of image making. But the flip side of this theory is that it overlooks a great deal of human intervention, which occurs in the design, construction, use, and even maintenance of highly automated visual uh, imaging systems. The presumed autonomy of image making machines is, is a theme which recurs frequently when looking at artworks involving machines and machine learning. The Christie's auction house has claimed, for example, that the infamous portrait of Edmond de Belmy was authored by an algorithm. And similar claims have been made, made by others, including Harold Cohen in his experimentations with his system, Aaron. Um, these ideas have contributed to the mythologization of, of AI and the machine artist, drawing legitimacy from the distancing of the human artist from the outputs of highly automated systems. But other artists have also been working with situations in which intentionality is seen as shared between human and machine, rather than attempting to distinguish one from another. In this artwork, for example, the artists present a, a highly autonomous imaging system in which vis visitors may curate a selection of images, which a printer then automatically makes into a personalized book. In such instances as this, it's often hard to distinguish human from machine intentionality. And importantly, expressions of intentionality may vary at different points in the process. Peter Paul Verbeck uses the term cyborg intentionality to describe various blends of human and technological intentionality. This concept helps demonstrate the level of nuance in human interaction with technology through the various different ways in which technology may mediate human intentionality, but also perceptual experience. So thinking about the complementary role machine learning may play in the creative practice I made a work called Deconstructing Representation, where machine learning is used as an explorative approach to visualize patterns within a large data set of images. So I began by compiling a data set of all the images I had ever saved in Instagram up to that point, thinking of this as a mood board that then would be analyzed by a GAN. Um, so then I, I trained the GAN to uh, create a, a new series of images based on that data set. The result of that process shows how the output images changes over time from quite noisy to more defined. I also conducted some less formal experiments in which I, I used openly accessible web demos to question aspects of machine learning through machine learning. Um, for example, I, I experimented with using the Wolfram image identifier to attempt to automatically classify images of abstract art from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. So this was in response to the paper, Deep Neural Networks Are Easily Fooled, in which researchers generated adversarial fooling images. But I noticed two problems in this project. Not only did a number of the supposed fooling images actually bear a great deal of visual resemblance to the image classes they were assigned by the deep neural network, I also wondered how the absence of an image class accounting for abstraction might influence the results. So from working with the Wolfram image identifier, I, what I found was 
unsurprisingly, the system is not very effective at labeling abstract art. Um, the exception to the, which uh, was kind of interesting because it, it was successful when there was a semiotic cue, such as a picture frame present in an image. Um, all the other images were assigned various labels that were not objectively accurate. And um, what I ultimately took away from the experiment was that very much like how humans impose meaning on non-representational images, machine learning systems may also do the same while picking up on visual patterns and resemblances in images that we may or may not be um, tuned into. So in conclusion, I'll just sum up some of the main insights that I've drawn through this research. So understandings of current practices involving machine learning in the production of images can be enriched by examining its relation to ongoing discourse concerning the role of technology in the production of images. This brings up unresolved discrepancies over the importance of visual as opposed to non-visual or processual aspects of images. And current discourse also returns to questions as as to whether humans or machines are to be credited as authors in highly automated image making processes. This also begs the question of who is to be considered the primary audience of such images. As a result, the, quest, the processes involved in image production play an important mediating role between the per human perceptual framework and that of the various forms of visual interpretation that are performed by automated um, systems. There's also an enduring tendency to view techno-scientific apparatus and techniques as autonomous from human influence. And this is used to frame the images produced by such systems as either the product of a machine artist or as detached from the subjective influence of, of humans and therefore objectively truthful and accurate. These polarities overlook a great deal of interrelation and levels of mediation between human and machine intentionality, as well as visual interpretation, which can be found in the production of images using machine learning. It's therefore not only difficult to, to distinguish between visual and non-visual and human from, from machine and visual artifacts of machine learning. So we, we therefore understand machine learning to, to play a role in a critical reevaluation of the image in terms of its defining attributes, what it means to make an image, and ultimately what is at stake in the image currently. Okay, thank you very much.